Thank you, Dr. Mays Ajan, for accepting to to have this interview with me, which basically looks at your research that's just uh, you've just finished at the University of Warwick. Could you just remind us what uh, the topic of your PhD was about? Uh, it's about uh, teaching and learning in large Syrian classes. Okay, and what level specifically uh, were you talking university about? University level, yeah. University level, university. great, yeah. Now, why did you decide, why did you choose that, that, that area of study for your, for your PhD? Um, well, that's a very interesting story, actually. Um, when I, uh, um, I am, a t I was a teacher assistant at uh, Lippo University. Okay. Uh, I was, uh, you know, sent to England uh, on this scholarship scheme to do an MA and a PhD in English language teaching. Yeah. Um, when I came here to do my MA to Warwick University, it was fantastic, you know, I, I get to know all new things. I, uh, I, it was the first time in my whole life to hear about learner autonomy, learner motivation, you know, these academic yeah. things. Yeah. And uh, so, but all, at all the time, there was something at the back of my mind telling me that, can we apply that in the Syrian context, Syrian university, large class context? Yeah. It's so difficult because, you know, how am I going to manage that? Or how am I going to monitor that in, in the large class context? Okay. Uh, so I used to think that, okay, Probably not. We won't. We won't be able to, to apply them. Mm. And then one day uh, in the MA year, towards the end of the MA year, a friend of mine, uh, whose name is Harry Kutcher, the one who is interviewing <laughs> me now, <laughs> gave a very interesting talk about his own teaching experience in in Cameroon. He talked about the challenges. You talked when you talked about the challenges that okay. were facing you and what have you. Uh, how how you approach them, what have you done to, to you know to deal with them? Yeah. Actually, that talk was very eye opening to me. You know, at least it made me think that yes, that's the context. Mm -hmm. But we, if we think about it, we can do things to help to help the situation in it. Okay. But first of all, we need to understand it. This is something, the idea of understanding how things are in this context, this okay. is something never ever occurred to me t to look at in my context. Mm -hmm. Because I used to think that, okay, this is, this is something given, we can't change it. But then after the talk, I thought that, okay, at least I can think about it and see how the people, w w what, what really the people are doing there. Okay. So that was the main motivation that yeah I can you know I, I need to to think and understand the large class context uh, in order to be able to see how you know different teaching methodologies could be applied there or yeah. whether they can be applied there or not. Yeah. Uh, then I started to read uh, about uh, large class literature and I found something that you know students voices are very uh, you know um, are not there, okay. yeah. especially at university level, yeah. and uh, so uh, I thought that this is um, it's unfair really because there are so <laughs> because large classes is made up of um, a huge number of students, but still the uh, students' voices are not heard, so it's yeah. really unfair. And uh, I thought that okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put uh, to 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 understand this context from the views of those who are in this context. So I focused on the teachers and the students mm -hmm. in that large class context. So I went to the uh, to uh, to a Syrian university and uh, I uh, had the I did the research with the students and with the teachers in the English department in that Syrian okay. university. Right. Okay. Now you talked about large classes yeah. in the Syrian university mm -hmm. context. Uh, would you just clarify exactly what you would mean by a large class, specifically as related to your own uh, uh, research? Yes. Um, well, before I go to the field, I, I had the idea in mind. And uh, let me just uh, uh, note something that I studied in that context okay. as a student, you know. So uh, when I went there as a researcher, I, I thought that the large class is because there are hundreds of students in this room, in the auditorium, in the okay. teaching room. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, that would your question now would lead me to to my findings actually okay the findings of that uh, of this research so when i went there i thought that yeah we have a large class and i i think there are something like 200 for 300 people in, in that class when i went there yes there were there, there were more actually there were something like 450 students right. in a big auditorium right. but when i talked to the students and the teachers i realized that it is not just being in a very huge room and that's it it's not just about the numbers that that matter to them now the students and the teachers they pointed at other things that are important like the lack of facilities in this teaching room okay. that the, uh, the the fixed benches um, the um, no no uh, teaching aids there mm. like no overhead projectors no screens or whatever to help and the students uh, they pointed out you know having talked about uh, about their experiences in this large class context they pointed at something very interesting they told me that as they progressed in their study mm. they uh, the large class being in a larger class was not at all seen as a negative thing to them oh, okay. because they thought that the quality of the teacher is much better Oh, okay. And that's that's the thing that is uh, you know is, is the most important thing to them. Oh, okay, right. Actually, the students. It turned out that the students uh, found uh, found their own uh, coping practices to deal with this large class context, with mm -hmm. the lack of facilities there in the in the um, in the teaching rooms. Okay. Um, but yeah, it remained that the teacher is the most important factor to them. Oh, that's interesting. Now, you, you've talked a lot about what the students said, yes. what the teachers mm. talked about. Uh, and that brings me to, to my next question about methodology, because yes. it's all too uh, easy to assume that you would go to the field and, 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 and just talk to, to students and mm. teachers. But what particular methodological route did you take? What concretely, what are the things you did? Yes. How did you go about yeah. collecting uh, Yes, first of all, I wanted to set my, uh, my research on a firm, qualitative uh, base. Because previous research and previous studies on large classes has been largely done on quantitative okay. base. And uh, so, it didn't, that's why I said that it didn't bring clearly to the surface what, what students uh, had to say about large classes mm -hmm. and even what teachers had to say about large classes you know I mean, you know in surveys you know just this number of of, stu of teachers said this about the, about this problem mm -hmm. but previous studies didn't delve into details into the real problems mm -hmm. or our detailed description to the to the pro problems facing teachers mm -hmm. so uh, this qualitative design allowed me to interview in depth mm. students and teachers and uh, when I went um, my I did the research in two phases the first phase was exploratory in the sense that I went to the to the field mm. I decided to focus on one year um, the students in that year they had four teachers okay. and uh, the teachers were uh, you know teaching the same group of students with this in, in this same uh, setting okay. so um, I was I was able to see that th how different tutors those those four different tutors reacted to the same situation differently and what students had to say about h how also students viewed those four tutors differently although okay. those tutors are teaching the same group of students and those students are being taught by the same group of tutors. Mm -hmm. So it was very interesting to see this, um, uh, how things are different between a tutor to tutor, and even though the, the overall setting is the same. Oh, okay, great. So I interviewed the students, and I interviewed the teachers, and I had loads of classroom observations. Actually, I was I was there with the students in in their classes in that with that with the year that I focused on. Okay. I was with them all the time, actually. So I was able to draw um, a detailed description of the setting mm. 
okay. from my point of view as a researcher in, in, yeah. in the scene. Yeah. And then triangulated that with what the students said and what the teachers uh, said about, about this whole situation. Okay. At that point, I was able to arrive at, an, at a good understanding, I would say, about, about the whole context, about the whole, uh, this large class context. What are the factors that are at play in that in that context? Okay. Now I know you've hinted already on on, on some of the findings of yes. your, your your study, yeah. but I'll just push that on a bit by t finding out from you mm. uh, whether there were any uh, points of convergence and maybe points of divergence between the perspectives of the teachers, uh, the different the four different teachers you talk to, and and the learners themselves. Exactly. Um, it's actually, yeah, there, there, there was a, a huge difference, I would say, because uh, the, four, the four tutors, they, they acknowledge that there are difficulties facing them in, in this teaching context. Okay. And the four tutors designed their teaching practices to best address the situation. Yeah. Now, this best address is according to the teacher's perspectives. But the wow. students actually received that in a completely different way. They did acknowledge that two out of the four tutors were excellent. They liked their classes and they, that's why their classes were very crowded. Oh, okay. While the third tutor was, her class was, you know, uh, there were around only one, 200 students in her class. So half, the, half of the auditorium was, was full of students. Yeah. But the th fourth one, only 12 students used to attend his class. Oh. Although, as I said, when, when in, in their interviews, each one of them did say that they designed their teaching practices to, to address the, the, the situation oh, that, and to suit the students and to, you know, to help the students learn mm. in this context. But, but students actually had, had a different perspectives on that. Yeah. This has led, actually, this was the motivation for the second phase. Okay. Is yeah. to go back to the field and to see what those good tutors, okay. the tutors whose, 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 lo whose classes are large, actually, okay. are the largest in okay. the department. So what do those tutors do? Uh, what are their teaching practices? What... Uh, what uh, how how have they developed their teaching practices, and mm. what uh, what are the um, characteristics of the good lesson, and and all that from students' perspectives was done okay. as well. What virtue would you give to research uh, that focuses on the learners, and how applicable would that be in our area uh, as 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 professionals, as teachers? Um, um, I would say, well, um. I can't really say that much, but what I would say is students, it turned out from my research, is students are the best people to know the teacher. Okay. And to, if I can say it in this way, to judge the to teacher. To judge the teacher. And yeah. to say whether this teacher is really, um, you know, good. Or to, to define what a good teacher, good teacher is. is. Okay. Because, uh, you know, for me as an observer, I could see things, but. Uh, but the students, as I said, they, they focus on things that are different from, from, from mm. what I could look at if I just yeah. went there. For instance, students highlighted so much the personal qualities of the, of the tutor. The tutor, okay. And the, the interaction opportunities created by the tutor in class. Okay. Now, that was something I, you know, mm. what, in, the, in, the, in the teacher's interviews, Teachers didn't um, point at these kinds of stuff, the personal qualities and stuff. Okay. And uh, uh, looking at the good tutor and the good lesson from students' perspectives revealed that students, um, uh, ha you know, appreciated the mental interaction in class yeah. rather than the verbal interaction, or in as much as the verbal interaction was appreciated by them. So uh, those good tutors motivated students to think and to, you know, to be uh, mentally active even if, they, if it was not possible for all the students to be verbally active in class because yeah. of the large class context. 
Okay. Actually, yeah. students were very sensitive to this fax, and they, 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 for in in previous research, actually, it was yeah. it was uh, it was something very new that students yeah. could pay attention to such to, to and such define teachers, such yeah. different way of interaction. Yeah. The interaction is not just about you know being asked a question and the student answers or the students verbally stating anything in class. Yeah. No, what they were they appreciated so much was being mentally active yeah. and mentally involved in class. Now let us talk about um, uh, research as a whole, uh, yes. your PhD research as a mm. whole. I, I, I would presume mm. from my own experience that it's not an easy endeavor and Absolutely. because we, some of our our listeners, some of the, uh, our colleagues watching this video mm -hmm and be may be interested in doing PhD in mm -hmm. the future yes. and doing research in the area of large classes yes. and yes. in maybe in countries where the resources are not very yeah. available like yes. was the case in yeah. in Syria yeah. uh, what what were some of the challenges and how did you did you uh, overcome so, some of these challenges yeah well um, we have always been told that research is not easy and yeah. data is messy and everything, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's the nature of research. However, in the uh, in the large class context, if you yeah. want to research that, and with the under resourced context, yeah. like like ours, it's it was it was really a challenge. And as a researcher, I was under difficult circumstances. <laughs> 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 to say to say the simplest thing, let me say, is yeah. that how to find an empty room in a crowded building to conduct the interview oh, yeah. with students it was so difficult actually all my interviews i i i conducted them in the gardens around campus because yeah. that was the only space we could find uh, we sat on the grass you know had the interview and that was the quietest place we could find yeah. So it was not easy at all, um, and then you know, and even even when it comes to the tutors, there is in 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 the in the department where I where I conducted the research, it was um, uh, there was lack of tutors that resulted in, in that you know a huge amount of students being taught yeah. by only one tutor. So even the tutors were very busy people. So to find the time to talk to me was. I, and I mm. so much appreciate that is that they 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 did find the time and they did want to talk about about the problems facing them. Mm. So um, so all in all, it has not been been easy when it comes to the resources. And um, other than that, it is just the the normal uh, I think uh, research challenges like yeah. conducting it, you know, um, and then collecting the data transcribing all the data which mm. was very very uh, time consuming mm. you know I'm well Mace, thank you very much for talking to My us pleasure. about your, your your PhD research pleasure. and congratulations once again thank for you so much and